and the rest of you who made this possible in the high sea on earth. And of course, uh, to be, I feel flattered that I'm invited as a part of the Marcus Garvey African Scholars series, lecture series. I'm going to talk a little bit this afternoon about uh, black on black violence, the psychodynamics of black self annihilation in service of white domination. <clears throat> the subject is a complex one and involves many levels. So obviously the time will not allow its discussion in any great detail. And as I go along, of course, I have to edit uh, what I have to say in light of the time. So uh, there will be some disconnectedness at some points left on uh, work because of the time system. The other reason uh, there will be some points left hanging is because uh, I do want to leave some time for interaction with you. The questions I heard on the radio this morning and uh, the kind of interaction that went on on the radio this morning uh, were very inspiring and so I'd like to kind of continue that kind of interaction that was uh, going on so I want to leave some time for that. Black on Black Violence. Some people of course have some problem with that title uh, but I'd advise you to to read the book and understand what that title implies. Uh, often many of us think that when we talk about Black on Black we are implying uh, that there's something inherently violent related to blackness and certainly that's not what the uh, book argues. The essence of the title, of course, is to have us as a community, thank you, confront the reality of violence in our community. And while we are aware that there's violence in other people's communities and there's violence in the white communities and so forth, we are concerned with that violence which occurs in our community. We are concerned with it because it threatens our community and threatens us as persons and individuals. It's connected though to so many other things that are, that, that are occurring in our community and in the world today. The subtitle, The Psychodynamics of Self-Annihilation in Service of White Domination is dealing with the implication that black on black violence is not an, a, the mere expression of some violence proneness in uh, many of our young men or an expression of violence in the black community per the community but that violence in the black community serves a social and political purpose that black on black violence is a necessity for maintaining this political and economic system. It maintains the cohesion of the American system. So in a sense the system creates it and maintains it and uses it for self-maintenance and we have to be aware of that. that Violence is a form of social interaction. It's not the kind of form we desire, nor the kind we encourage. But it is still a social encounter of a special type. An undesirable social encounter, particularly on the part of the victim. But yet it is still social because it involves people. And it involves people, individuals, who have a social history are interacting in terms of their social history. It involves people who sometimes are acting in terms of social desires, sometimes in terms of social motives, in terms of the fact that they've been able to value certain things. They've been told that if they were to buy and wear certain things and if they were to uh, present themselves in these things, or if they were to consume certain things, 
they would be perceived differently than what they are. A lot of our psychological, much, much what we get into is the result of the way we have reacted to white on black violence. And that means we have to get into some self-analysis. How have we reacted to this attack on our culture, on our history, and on our persons? This constant threat that we feel as African people, this constant tension and so forth. How have we dealt with this? I'm going to do another book I'm, I'm telling you on, uh, as I think I've mentioned here, I call it Death Wish. How whites wish we were dead. And they do. Yes, they really do. They wish we were not alive as a people. Yeah. In New York, you see, on one hand, they, they, they tell us we're eating up their wealth on welfare. When the vast majority of people on welfare, of course, are white, but you know, that's another story. And they don't want to support us anymore on welfare. Now recently in New York then, Jenkins, Jenkins says, well, this, was, this city which is majority black, Latino, and Asian, in this city, only 7% of the dollars spent by the city goes to business persons in these communities. So we're going to try to see at least that 20% of it goes to these communities for services that these communities will provide. Not charity, but the services, and they will be paid for their services. New York City spends well over $30 billion, you see. Now what did the whites say? They screamed about that. Now here we are saying what? We're going to sell services to the city. And as our businesses expand, we will what? Create jobs, hire people, take them off welfare, get them to working, and he's still what? Damning you. Well, what does that really mean then? It means death. I don't want you to be on welfare, and I also don't want you to what? Earn any money. Then what am I going to do? Die. And I can show you parallels like that throughout in many many other areas. When you combine this kind of death wish, whether it's conscious or unconscious, with the kind of power that whites have, it too represents itself in reality. Black people will kill themselves in response to this unconscious death wish. Yes. In dealing with not being able, let us say, to work because the white will accuse you of using affirmative action to take their jobs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, after they run you out to construction sites, then refuse to give what? Welfare on the other hand. You get a headache and all other kind of aches and you start taking drugs. Right. Yeah, to deal with it. Overeating, or doing many of the things that we do. And at that point then, the wish takes on what? Reality. And the person commits slow suicide and starts murdering. We murder and kill ourselves in, in, in the terms of the death wish of white folk. That's right. Yeah. But that's another book. Look out for it, though. That's right. <laughs> So you see, we got to look at and understand those mechanisms so that we can counter those mechanisms, you see. So what's happening here is we fight and react to white right on black violence, anger remains at a high level in this community, and every black person is angry, I don't care how peaceful and you, uh, you know, humble you may appear to be, it's there. Yeah, it's there. Yeah, we try to hide it. We try to hold it down. It's there. Fear. Not knowing when these... When your faith rests in the hands of another people and you don't know how, how in the hell they're going to act. You got to have a fear there. When you're going to be insulted, rejected, and all those kind of things. We have, So, you know, we have to go through as a people chronically. Shame. Guilt. Self-contempt. 
self-alienation. Many of us just want to get away from ourselves. I'm not black. I was human before I was black. Got some crazy group making that statement now. All this other stuff, you know. I'm anything but black, please. We get displaced aggression, we're angry, but we can't attack the people who are doing it to us. We attack fellow victims. Right. We even identify with our aggressors. We want to be just like the people that rape the robbers. We restrict our mental field, deliberately, in a sense, become dumb, hoping that what we don't know won't hurt us. <laughs> and therefore we invest in knowing nothing. <laughs> and therefore, you know, escape responsibility and the pain of knowledge. You see? Yeah, we learn to be dumb. Yeah, we work at it. You can look at it in the school, working at being dumb. I'm telling you. And that's a reality because we, how many of us grew up when, uh, under the ages of when a white man called you a smart nigga, you know you're in trouble. And for sake to sake, you didn't want that label to get out. <laughs> you know? And uh, some of us spend acting down in front of white men until we actually became what we pretended to be. And some of us then identified that with Negro culture. Yeah. And now we make studying books and gaining knowledge acting white. You know? This kind of game. Here are the people, the discovery, the discoveries of writing and the book and so forth. Now have youngsters who call people who read books and so forth nerds and geeks. It's an amazing turnaround, isn't it? Yeah. In order to maintain their prestige and peer acceptance, they must reject knowledge. What kind of game is that? This is what happens. So we restrict our visual field, we restrict our perceptual field, mental field. Many of us then become passive, reactive, and we internalize the racism. Now, we can deal with this, and this is common to black people across the board. I don't care what class you belong to. However, being a member of class, of a particular class, can mitigate some of these and, and most of these basic uh, reactions on the part of all black folk. You see, uh, having money can mitigate it and permit uh, us to express these feelings in different sort of ways and to hide them in different sort of ways. Family structure also can mitigate some of this anger and shame and all the other things that I mentioned. Education, skills, personal characteristics and competencies, jobs, religious, spiritual values, and things of this nature also can mitigate this common fear, common stress, common anger, common shame, common guilt, and all that stuff that occurs as a result of black on white violence. That's why all of us are not necessarily what violent. In fact, why a minority us or so, you see. Have you ever wondered, you know, that the major problem is why all people, black folk going crazy in this society and, and just running over it? Yeah, that becomes the question. Why are there more of us in this business? But when you look then and combine this, these psychological effects that are common to the community and then combine them with the ordinary crises that adolescents go through, okay, as adolescents moving from childhood into adulthood, from boyhood into manhood, and what that involves. Adolescence in this culture is a very volatile time for the, for the youngster. It's a time that they struggle with their identity. And yet, the black adolescent's identity is being hammered on and confused and knocked on. And that's why he's different from the white adolescent. Even though the white adolescent may be struggling with his identity, who am I and what am I? It's still not the same thing, you see. We get caught up in false equalities. 
You see, well, white boys and white girls are also trying to find who they are and what they are. But do they have another group saying, you are, you're naturally dumb, you're naturally inferior, you're naturally this, you're naturally that, and creating this in addition to what you would call that normal crisis? That is what the black dimension to the adolescent crisis. That's why you just can't take an adolescent psychology book and leave it at that. There is the added dimension there. Who am I? The adolescent must identify finally with the, a, an ethnic group if they have not identified already. Maintain a gender identity. Am I masculine? Am I feminine? How should I express my characteristics? What characteristics are associated with masculinity and femininity? What are the characters of being a man? And yet again, we have as black men the problem of being under the domination of white men. That creates a problem in our arriving at our definition of what it means to be a man in America. Yes. And that adds a whole nother dimension to the struggle that the African male has to go through in America. And a great deal of black male adolescent violence is centered right around that struggle. What does it mean to be a man? And under the domination of white men. How do I express my manhood? How do I become the man and express the prerogative of manhood the way they say I should? White men. And yet when I do, they then attack me for doing so. How do I get out of this dilemma? And often then what you have is what I call reactionary masculinity, as you see in movies like Juice and New Jack City and other uh, black movies that are going on out here are people trying to define themselves as men but being under the oppressive regime of white men can only express it in terms of violence and putting down of other black males and the abuse of black females and the abuse and use of black children a whole nother game going on here and there are the other crises of adolescence, you see, peer acceptance and what that means. Consumption, wearing various things, you see. Issues of money, issues of jobs, all of those complicated by being black in America. This is the adolescent. And what are we saying now? The black adolescent is dealing with these issues in addition to the general anger and to the general anxiety and to the general stress that's endemic to all of the black community. Now you can begin to see the build up, you see, of why it comes out in angry expression. Now then you place this adolescent in the inner city and look at its socioeconomic environment. And what do you see there then? Miseducation. An education that in no way prepares him or her to cope in a healthy sense with their situation. Because you got a white curriculum. You got a curriculum designed to teach the white child. Jeez. Jeez, and in the name of equality, Thank you. you root for miseducation. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 I want my children to have the same education they got you out of your mind. <laughs> They're not in the same situation. They don't have the same history. They don't have the same psychology. They don't have the same destiny. Why are you then trying to give them the same education? The education is going to drive them mad. That's why they act up and misbehave. And those that doesn't drive mad and make drop out and, and have learned and all the other things, it alienates. And there are those of us who go through the whole system at the price of alienating ourselves. Yeah. You can't come out of it whole. 
That's no way. Because that educational system is designed to solve white folks' problems. And you measure it by the degree and your academic success is measured by the degree to which you can contribute to their advancement and not your own. Yes. You're not studying in your economics classes how to take that money back from white folk, which is what you should be studying. Yeah. Mm -mm. You're studying how to help them count the money they've taken from you. Yeah. In fact, you're in there to give them advice on how to rob you more. Have Ray Charles sing this song. You got the right thing, baby. Whatever it is. Put some churchy music next to this Coke or Pepsi with 16 teaspoons of sugar in it and kill their kidneys. Yeah. But because they love gospel sounding music and love old Ray, and he turns them on, and you, you, you put that Pepsi in his hand, and with that music, and they will transfer the love they have for him and the feelings they have for the music onto the Pepsi. And then when they drink Pepsi, they get that jazzy feeling. And they feel good while they kill themselves. <laughs> I'm dying and going to heaven. <laughs> they get sugar, diabetes, and everything else. Because they can't go through the day without a good liter of Pepsi. What has Pepsi done for us? Where has Pepsi contributed to the institutions you need for your children? Where have they built teenage centers and recreational centers and so forth? Where have they built cultural centers so you can appropriately educate your children? Millions and millions of dollars going into Pepsi because of MC Hammer. Ray Charles, using your own cultural product against your own interests. And now you're saying you're not. I'm the first Negro who said you are crazy. That's what it is. Yeah. And now then you become a part of the system. Talk about how you made it. My mama told me to go on and be something. Watch out there. Uh, is, is yours the only mama that told you that? Are you kidding? I'll tell you. Yeah, this is the game. And we're supposed to be proud because you got a job. Come on in. Get out here. Ain't we advancing? He's the first Negro that got this, but you still starving. Come on, let's let's get on in. Yeah. Oh, let's move on. <laughs> it's too much. Uh, look at this world that these adolescents are in. Yes. The world of miseducation. Joblessness. Only about twenty percent of them are working. And jobs and work are a part of people's self-definition. It stabilizes society. It stabilizes the relationship between people. It defines their relationship and stabilizes communities and so forth. When you have people who are not working and people who do not have jobs and people who are insecure about their job, it destabilizes families and communities and ethnic groups. Jobs are the means by which people become disciplined and discipline and organize their behavior yes. and organize themselves. Yes. When then you have miseducation and joblessness and so forth then, it becomes difficult for our youngsters and ourselves to organize our behavior and maintain self-control. And therefore, without a sense of security, without a sense of destiny and a sense of purpose, the youngster has no psychological means with which to resist impulses. Does not have a system of values and purpose and meaning with which he can evaluate desires and wishes and tastes. 
is not able then to inhibit impulses and, and drives in the interest of long-term goals Go and cannot then tell himself why he should not engage in this particular bit of self-destructive behavior. <laughs> and yet what do we have here? Joblessness, miseducation, and so forth, and consequently you're going to have large groups being impulsive and violent and seeing no real reason why they should engage in self-control. And what does it gain? They are using, of course, their European masters as, as uh, models. And they see that they got where they got by raping and robbing and knocking people in the head. Right. And they follow suit. Follow suit. But see, we like to talk about the models within the black community giving them that. That's the white models. It's the, it's the very system itself. You have then, the, you have here the absence of skills. The whole disinvestment of the black communities factories, industries, and everything moving out of these communities. These are the kind of things that current youngsters face that we didn't face as youngsters. That's why we have to be, watch that stuff, when I was, these youngsters are living in almost a totally different world than what we lived in even 20 or 30 years ago. Yeah. When these other immigrants came over here and dropped out of school, they could go to the stockyards, the dockyards, or yeah. to the factories, or this place, or that place, and that, that was a safety net under them. And even with the minimal education, they could find something basic to do. But there are no more dockyards and stockyards and factories and other things that catch dropouts anymore. And at this point, it's the blacks who are now in that position, but the net is no longer there. Even when we were teenagers, there were that some kind of basic stuff there but a good deal of that is gone this is what they're facing the ghettoization of our people to the extent where we are literally then put on reservations and we live within a ring of whites single uh, parenthood something which became a majority uh, factor only about 20 years ago yeah since the 1970s this has not been the condition of black people this, where, where the single-headed family has become the majority family in the black community, is a recent occurrence. Yes, it is. And, and, and yes, and of course to destroy and to maintain our system here, their system. In other words, then youngsters are coming up in the, in the general system where in family structures that even 20, 30 years ago, youngsters didn't come up in. You had to look at this. This is the situation that we face. Hopelessness, negative, conservative political administrations, mass advertisement that looks at teenagers as a market. When I was a kid, you got what your parents bought. To a great extent, the advertising was to convince the parents to buy it for the children. Now it's reversed. You look at even little kids are representing the market. Five-year-olders represent a $10 billion market. How do we get them to spend it? How do they get a $10 billion? You know they're going to worry mom and dad to death and get it. You know that. Teenagers, you talk what? Directly to them. The TV talks directly to the little kids. When you sit them down in front of the TV, the sugar ads for the cereal, the toys, and the whole thing talks directly to the children. It doesn't say, come in, mama, and look at this so you can buy it now. The child gets the message and takes it to the parent. And now so the children are looked at as a market. And what is going on with advertising? Desire is being created. You see, we often say, freedom is doing what we want to do. That's not freedom. You've got to figure out what made you want to do it in the first place. And when you, when you trace your wants and desires, you may find out that they have actually been artificially what? Created. And therefore, when you are pursuing most what you want, you are most enslaved. However, psychologically, you feel most what? Free. And that's the backwardness of the system, you see. And so you get these things that manipulate the taste of American people. What did I just say about Pepsi? That's a manipulation of taste. And the European then makes you want everything that he owns. And if you got it, it's no good. 
has no good at all. Yeah. He don't have value if what? He has it. Then he creates a page for it. Yeah. And then sets the limits and the, the rules for getting it. Yeah, and plays the game. If you want this, you got to do this. You got to do that. And the game is on. This is what our teenagers face in a way that we never face. The total flow of guns. If you saw the New York Times, the uh, um, Wall Street Journal, there was a two and a half page spread on the, on the families that are getting wealthy selling guns within the black community. More or less standing white folk. Flooded with guns. The ghetto drugs. All kinds of propaganda, flight of industry powerless, we got all of this. So what I'm saying, you got to combine the ongoing white on black violence, combine the psychological after effects of that violence, combine the way we react to that violence, and combine that with the socio-economic environment in which we live, and you have then the lethal interactive context for the creation of violence itself within the community. What does that mean then in terms of prevention? If we know then that we have internalized stereotypes, if we know the foundation of this self-destructive behavior among ourselves as a result of self-alienation and so-called self-hatred, a lack of knowledge of self and so forth, if we know that this is the result of displaced aggression and frustration, the inability to deal appropriately with anger, then we know what it's going to take to get our people out of this situation. What I tell people, you can know the characteristic problems of black children by asking yourself the questions. What characteristics must not exist in them in full power if the system is to maintain itself? You understand what I'm saying? You ask yourself that. Or you can ask it the other way around. What characteristics, if they existed in black folk, would threaten the status quo? And you will see that the children have the problems with those very characteristics. We must not be able to love each other fully and deeply because that becomes the basis of unified action. That becomes the basis of our defending each other against our enemies. But since, if, since in defending our, each other against our enemies, we are afraid of being annihilated by our enemies, we must repress our love. You see? Because love then for us becomes dangerous. It becomes almost associated with self-annihilation. Yeah, that's why we have trouble with it. Yeah. Because if we truly loved in the way we should, we could not see our children being miseducated and mistreated and see the kind of stuff that is happening to our people. And it means that ultimately we would have to get into the position to come one-on-one -on -one with the white man and end his capacity to do it to business with us. But we don't want war. And I'm telling you black people, you're going to have to have war or death. Yes, the reason why black men kill each other is because they have not yet decided to kill white men. That's it. That's it. And because they aren't being trained to do it, which is their role, and it's not a black woman's problem to confront the white male, it is our problem as black males to do it. The very essence of the black male today is to end the power of the white male and bring it to a close. And that's the essence of Afrocentric education, preparing the black male for war. Otherwise, you may as well die right now, right here, because that's where you're going. In black on black violence is a perverted manhood, a perverted masculinity. You prove your manhood by attacking each other. 
prove your manhood by impregnating and carrying on and leaving these babies uh, not cared for. Yes. And not providing them with an economic future and an economic system, and that makes you a man. Man, I guess so many, I don't know who they are, what they are. Uh-uh, that won't do. That's not manhood. Mm-mm. Prove manhood by how fast you can beat down another man. What kind of game is that? That's ultimately a form of cowardice. Because the true enemy is left undealt with. You know that. Yeah, and that's the name of the game. I'm telling you, oh boy. Our time is going. Which we <laughs> yes. They would uh, perhaps impress people as possessing power and prestige and so forth. And therefore, they are willing to kill or maim or damage or con or do something to other individuals in order to achieve what they've been told is valuable. In Black on Black Violence, I talk about the black bourgeois criminal. The idea being that in a sense, what the so-called black uh, violent criminal desires is quite in line with what is desired by the black middle class. Desired by the middle class in general. Yes. Cars, houses, VCRs, you know, fancy sneakers, all these other things. And in a sense, have been told that those things are valuable, you see. And his methodology for achieving those things that he's been told are valuable is where we have a problem. So in a sense, the criminal act itself is organically related to the social system and does not necessarily have to flow out of some twisted criminal nature but out of trying to fulfill standard desires and standard wishes that have been projected through the media. But because of his own personal and social and cultural circumstances, the desire to fulfill, the effort to fulfill those desires are twisted and often may end up in violence, self-destructive behavior, and the destroying of others. And therefore, you see, we have to move away from this ideology that so-called criminals have some kind of criminal nature. They have a nature that is quite in line with the so-called non-criminal. Some of you have seen the movie Juice. That movie supposedly is about the issue of respect. We talk about respect. You read the Franklin sayings about respect. And that is a desirable uh, state of being, to be respected by others. But the issue becomes, how do you gain respect? And as the movie says, what price are you willing to pay for it? And what price are you willing to make other people pay for respecting you, you see? And it, it deals with it in the concept of how absolute ideas, which is what we as a community tend to believe in, because we often don't uh, work through an idea in our context. We just take the idea absolutely without recognizing that the same idea in a different context has a different outcome, you see. So the desire for respect per respect within the context of the way the black economic and political system is organized, within the context of the so-called inner city and so forth, if it is not organically related to the social and political realities that we live in, will more often than not lead to some form of self-defeating, self-destructive behavior. And this is true across so many areas. It's even true across the areas of moral beliefs. We go to our churches often and we take up absolute moral uh, beliefs. 
and we express them within our own context and even though we express them with good intention often their results are not what we desire and I mentioned one where many of us feels, feel very moral about not seeing color and not making racial distinctions among people and we feel so morally righteous when we do so and we forget that if we can't see color then we can't see our own children because they are children of color you see. and I'm telling you a good deal of this black on black violence is the result of our telling our children over and over again to pay no attention to race don't, don't create any special feelings toward people like yourself don't differentiate and make a difference between your people and another people that all people are just alike and it doesn't make any difference who they are so they see you and they just see you as a pocketbook walking down the street you see it doesn't matter you're just an economic opportunity from that point on you're not like their mother their grandmother their sisters, their brothers, you're just another person. You see? And when you tell people that, that they should have any special reverence for their people, and then you put them in the midst of their people, where they spend all of their days and lives, and then you combine it with these other uh, lethal orientations, you're going to find that they're not going to rape and rob and murder all people yeah. indiscriminately that 94% of the people they rape, rob and kill will be black folk yes, will. you know so this non-discriminative look on the world leads to discrimination feel then with your piety about not seeing color you forget that not all children of various ethnic groups are equally needy and if you really want to be charitable you try to spend your wealth and spread your wealth that it benefits the most needy in the society which are our children at this point but because we are so non-discriminating we end up giving more money to people who have more money than they know what to do with in the first place and the rich therefore get richer and the poor get poorer and those are our children and us as a people because we are not making any difference we are not looking at them differently and therefore we are not spending and, and, and investing in terms of the differences and those children then pay us back by terrorizing us and making us fear them and suffer the way we do as adults you see in a backhanded sort of way then people who don't see color don't spend and invest in terms of color in a backhanded way finance criminality and maintain criminality in a sense your very morality becomes a source of sin creation this situation, of course, has to change. Must change. Must change. We must make it change. How do we change it, as I'm saying here, then? In other words, all of the characteristics we complain about serve an economic function for whites. And for other ethnic groups. Our lack of self-confidence means that we don't go into business and take the kind of risk we should take. Other people that have it will take it. Yeah. Our unreliability in relationship to each other means we can't depend on each other's support when we go into business yeah all it, and the other people do what benefit from it you see in every characteristic our inability to engage in abstract thinking and use that abstract thinking to develop technology and to develop systems means that the we we in a sense fall subject to people who can use it when you take money from the mouths of your children 
and hand it to other people. In a sense, then, you're financing and motivating and developing criminality among your children. And so in your moral righteousness, as you tunnel that money downtown and take it to the rich, you see, in a sense, your moral righteousness becomes a part of the, the development and creation and maintenance of sinful behavior. So we have to be discriminating and we have to understand what is going on here. This so-called non-discriminating attitude among black people maintains the system. And if it maintains the system, as we shall see later, it maintains black on black violence. And in that sense then, this violence maintains the system itself and maintains white domination. Black on Black Violence is a book that looks at how this psychology is brought about. We have to look at the fact that America is a criminal enterprise. <laughs> that the American government is a mafia operation. It is a criminal system. Now, a lot of people have problems with that. <laughs> I can understand that. As a matter of fact, when you study the history of the world, you see many nations are criminal systems. But, you know, we, when, we get, when we, you know, get through with our infatuation with Egypt, then in part we'll start getting into some other realities of God in the world. Because we need to look at some realities, you know, that we're ignoring. The hard, dirty kind of realities is that we've been avoiding. This country began as a crime, yeah. as a major, major act of genocide. Yes, the murder and almost total destruction of the Native American population, a stealing of their lands and wealth, and an imprisoning of the residues on so-called reservations. Yeah. And we have to keep that in mind. Whatever you may think about its constitutions and its great, uh, you know, so-called values and liberties and all of these other things, it is still rooted in the blood and death of nations of people. And you cannot deny that. And that murder and that original genocide is still at the very center of this country right now. <laughs> the other dastardly deed, of course, was the enslavement of African people. An imprisoning of those people, of our people, and an extortion of their labor and an extortion of their production. A stealing away of our people from their lands and a killing of hundreds and thousands and millions of black people. And a total restructuring and disordering and, and, and disorganizing of the African continent. Along with stealing its lands and its wealth as well. You have to understand that. And so the whole of whatever you see here, I don't care how beautiful you see it, is rooted in rot and murder. And, you got, and we got to deal with it. And we don't want to deal with that, you see, as a people. I was in Minnesota recently, and one of the, my hosts drove me around one of the fashionable neighborhoods there. You know, the, the neighborhood by the lakes, that's where you really make it. Where you look out, your house looks out on these big lakes, you know. And you see people with these big show windows and picture windows. And then you have the next class that lives by the creek. <laughs> and that's where the bulk of the black bourgeoisie is located. <laughs> you know, it's still up, but you see, you move, when you really moved up, you move from fronting the creek to the lake. <laughs> you know. And then there are those who need a near the creek nor lake. 
But then I say, you know, I told my brother this is that you know, so you can look at these houses as being beautiful and what have you. But then you can ask yourself the question, how much energy does it take to heat all this, you know, and to maintain these houses? And, but at the bottom of it, you can also ask, how much death do these houses represent? You see, we're so used to looking at house beautiful and so forth, but we don't stop to recognize how many people's lands had to be stolen for the American way of life. How many people had to be enslaved to maintain the American way of life? That life that we claim we want to have just like everybody else. Yes. Yeah. You go to Jacob Javits Center in New York, I don't know, maybe it's two or three football fields wide or whatever. And you, and you think about the fact that the whole of that expanse is air-conditioned or heated. And you have whole domes, right? Then you have to ask yourself, this kind of life is only possible if you have cheap oil and cheap fuel. Yes, that's the only way. It's, that's, it's only possible. Which means then, if this life is to occur, the Arabs cannot set the price, you see, for their so-called resources. And the United States and the Europeans must maintain them under their foot and manipulate their prices and everything in order to maintain the American way of life. You see, and you hear, but you see, they invoke these magic words and people don't even understand what they are. We're protecting the American way of life. We're protecting American interests. What are those interests? You know, where, where are they? What do they mean? You see, and we have to keep this in mind. What must be done to other people to maintain your way of life? To a good extent, the black on black the criminal is a duplicate of the white governmental system. Yes, in fact, it's the best model for criminality in the world. Because it's a psychopathological system. And you can see in black on black where I talk about the white racist narcissist in love with themselves convinced of their superiority believing that all other people are on the earth to serve their ends yes that same kind of attitude that the white racist has toward non-white people is the same kind of attitude ultimately internalized by the black violent criminal. Yes. He in effect becomes a white racist. And every other person then becomes into existence for their pleasure, for their comfort, for their egos, you see. And they're self-centered and self-concerned. And therefore, to a good extent, the victim, as we will talk about a little bit later, identifies with the victimizer, you see. He even calls his victims often by the same name that the white racist calls him and expresses the same attitude. It's interesting that we as a people really obey the laws of white folk. <laughs> Yeah, you know, because we have some reverence for the law, the law. Even your Bible says there's honor among thieves. And thieves have regulated and organized systems. Simply because it's regulated and organized and you have special rules. You know, you have that in the mafia. So the fact that you have organized rules and values doesn't mean you have a non-criminal system. As I said again, whites, you are not less criminal 
In fact, you're the most criminal people the earth has ever seen. <laughs> yeah. I see a lot of you, you know, all people are sinning and falling short of the glory of God. Some of them have, fall, have fallen more short than others. <laughs> a devil is what a devil does. Okay? You got to keep that in mind. So when I'm saying that these people are most criminal, I'm making an empirical statement. One that can be evaluated in terms of actual experience and actual occurrence. No one has equaled these people to the extent that wherever they have put their foot in the lands of other people, they have degraded, if not outright murdered and destroyed those people. That is a fact. You show me where African people have stepped over the globe, killing, murdering, raping, and robbing to the extent of European white folk. And then you can talk about how everybody is, you know, short. No, it's not. <laughs> the reality is there. We are here as a result of that reality. The Indians are destroyed as a result of that reality. The Tasmanians are destroyed as a result of that reality. The Australian so-called Aborigines have been destroyed as a result of that reality. Central and South American Indian tribes and groups have been destroyed as a result of that reality. Africa has been colonized as a result of that reality. You see it, what? Everywhere. And yet we don't want to face the reality that we are dealing with an evil people and a devilish and demonic people. And we think it's being racist to tell the truth. And it is written in their histories by them. It's the same kind of game that Jeffries ran into, taking what? Books written by Jews documenting their own uh, involvement in slavery and the other folk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see? And then want to to deny the truth and reality of what he was saying. Yeah, go ahead. You see? And you get a lot of blacks who want to go along with that because they, we don't want to deal with the truth either. We want to be loved too much by our rapists and robbers and killers. And we want to deny what they've done to us as a people. The white being the most criminal group of people that the earth has seen in a long time, if ever. Isn't it interesting, though, that they can project the image of moral superiority? <laughs> and being civilized with their record. You know? Yeah, it's an amazing accomplishment that their victims will say, I want to be just like them. I want my children to have just what they got. You know, people who are victimized the most want their children to be like them the most. Isn't that an interesting phenomenon? Yeah. But it has to do in part, and we can't talk about it much today, with the process of legitimization. The legitimization of criminality. You are not less criminal, white folk. You are able to legitimize your criminality. Yes. Yeah. And that's the deal. Yeah. What do we mean legitimize? Quick, you see, it's not enough for a person to have power and to possess power. Other persons must feel that that power is what? Legitimate. That the person has authority to do what they're doing. A, an elected official and an unelected official can have the same or similar power. But the non-elected official may be seen as a dictator and resented and resisted by the people, you see, because they see 
his exercise of power as illegitimate you see as having not been consented to by the rules but they may be exercising some of the power but in one instance where the power is perceived as illegitimate the population will often at some point go into revolution against it because they feel it's it's yeah. it's not rightful authority a rightful power yeah. how do then how does then power become legitimate to a degree to a good degree it is legitimized through ritual and ceremony yeah. <laughs> you see and that's the power of ritual the thing and ceremony when we install Officers, you know, raise your hand. I do swear, I'm, 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 I'm. and until you do that, you're not authorized yet. <laughs> and it's a ritual, but it's very what? Very important. Yeah, put your hand on this book. <laughs> a legitimization process. Right now, we are going through a ritual through the presidential primaries. Yeah. They run from state to state and make meaningless speeches. And people drop pieces of paper in boxes or whatever. You know? They've already been bought. Oh yeah, it costs fifty million dollars to run for president. That campaign has to be what? Finance. And people are not giving that money for charity. There has to be a return on those people who are paying. So in a sense, the candidate has already been compromised and bought by his contributors to begin with. Okay? Now what they need for the population to do is ratify their bribery so that they will accept the legitimacy of the scam that's going to be run on them once they get in. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. And simply now because they go through the motions of primaries and presidential campaigns, they've already been bought and captured. And the old system gives you two choices. You know, one bought one over here, one bought one over there. You see? And now you think you're exercising democracy, choosing one of the other of the two crooks. Right? But you feel comfortable with it because you have what? Voted for them. You have gone through what? The ritual of voting. You see? And after that, and when they go through. And, and you know the chief function of government, you see, like the chief function of a mafia organization is to enforce contracts. Yeah, that's why when we have uh, violation of contracts, we run to the courts, don't we? Yeah, the major function of it is to enforce contracts and to maintain what they call property relations. You see? So at one point, the government maintained the contract of the slave master and the slave. This slave belongs to you. And you can go to court. And if he escapes from you, he is a criminal. And if he escapes many times, he has a criminal nature. <laughs> He's genetically criminal. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> That's why you have to be careful when you, before you start talking about criminal natures and all that kind of stuff. Because what is a crime changes over time. It was a crime for a black person as a slave to seek to escape from involuntary servitude. And it would be backed by the U.S. government. Okay? That's why you got to study laws and get over this, you know, this la-la perception of law it is the imposition of power and a means by which the powerful legitimize uh, their power and make it the subordinate people accept their power over them as legitimate Nelson Mandela negotiating with thieves and crooks legitimizing the original theft of land 
and then permits his wife to be even judged by these crooks and, and dogs. Amazing situation there. It's an amazing situation there. Legitimizing their right to sitting judgment. A bunch of crooks and criminals and thieves and murders and robbers are going to sit in judgment? <laughs> it's an amazing thing. But again, it just shows you what? The power of ritual and game playing. So what do you do? You come over here and you rob and kill and stab the Indian. Put germ warfare on him, sell him drugs, addict him to alcohol, do all the kinds of things that you do. Then you go through a ceremony. Now look, you're going to be the mayor. And you will be the keeper of records. You see? And we're going to measure this land by feet. See, the land ain't got nothing to do with the land is whatever it is. Doesn't matter what you do. It's what it is, right? <laughs> okay. But now what we're going to do, you hand over these pieces of silver to me, or these pieces of paper, and then you sign your name on this piece of paper, and then I stamp it with this thing here, and now you are the owner of this land. Yeah, and people fall for that. And go for that, and go with that, you know. But we often don't look at the absurdities on which the whole of human civilization and life is based. And I don't want to be too cynical here, but it pays, you know, to sometimes look at things a little more closely. Because we've bought the delusion of private property. First. We think there's some called private property. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as if you can actually own a piece of land. You always rent it. I don't care how much you pay for it. Stop paying taxes next year and it's gone. <laughs> yeah, you're still renting it. You know? But the game is on, you know, people it's in, in private property is a major form of robbery. But that's another story, that's another day. So what do we have here then? You know, the European legitimizing original death and murder you see and therefore through the legitimization process and through the process of ritual and so forth getting other people to accept them and perceive their position in the world as legitimate and then to perceive them after such dastardly deeds as somehow representing moral and civil superiority to other people. It's an amazing game. And we must see through this kind of thing. And they use then these rituals and games to try to wash the blood off their hands. But we must see it for what it is. Because the truth does not go away. It makes even then their beautiful constitutional statements and bills of rights lies. Right. And which is one of the reasons why they cannot be realized in the favor of non-white people, no matter how good and grateful they sound. Because the European has not repented of his original sins. You'll go to these churches and talk about repent your sin, but you won't demand the repentance of the people who rule over us and make our lives miserable. Yeah. And you think then that somehow they're going to get away with what they've done. Go ahead, brother. It's not going to happen. It can't happen. If the white man is going to get away with what he's done without suffering and paying for it, then how can we, how can we be truly churchy? That's right. Understand what I'm saying? Because the church is built on the idea that what? Sin is paid for at some point, at some level. But we're willing for this man to work, murder and rob and kill Indians and enslave us and do all of it, and he's still going to get away with it. And I tell them often, here you are, you think that you go around and you rape, murder, murder and mob, rob and do all the things you do, and then you think you have the right to sleep well at night. <laughs> 
Okay. Yeah, that you have the right to walk down the street and feel secure. Are you kidding? Do you see the arrogance there? And to walk among the very people you victimize and feel completely secure. What an arrogance. What a narcissistic attitude. You see. And some of the victims even think that's going to happen. You know? At some point, he's got to pay. And he's paying. And shall pay more. Yes. Black on black violence is the stepchild of white on black violence. It grows out of the original white on black violence. A violence that has never stopped since the very beginning. The violence of slavery, the violence of extorting the labor of other people, the violence of Jim Crowism, of segregation, of lynching, of police brutality, of injustice, of miseducation, of lies and propaganda, assassination of the black character, all kinds of violence, psychological and otherwise, has occurred and is still occurring and will occur tomorrow and day after tomorrow and next month and next year. Yes. And to a great extent, what we call the black on black violence is a reaction to this white on black violence. Thank you. The means by which some of us have tried to deal with the violation of our truth and of ourselves as people. And we must see that at bottom. But see, the white criminologists like to keep you on the level of genetic orientation, of biological orientation, that other kind of stuff to keep you from looking at its roots, which begins with them. For the whites to practice this kind of violence that I just mentioned, me and to appear in their own eyes to be superior, to be civilized, for them to convince themselves that they are morally superior to the rest of the world means that they have to play tricks on their own minds and the minds of the victims. What do I say? We often deceive by manners, you know. We think good manners means being civilized. You know, we confuse those two things. We look at the educational channels and they take us back to merry old England. Right? And we see the kings and the queens talking in perfect English. In their dainty gowns. Drinking their tea and eating their crumpets. <laughs> Talking about their literature and their art and their science and their technology. And we swear that they're so civilized. And yet I have to tell people, but at the same time they're engaging in this behavior. They're killing and murdering Native Americans. They're colonizing whole continents of people. Yes, you see. Enslaving Africans. In fact, it's the wealth that comes from this criminal activity that makes these good manners possible. And therefore, a brutal savagery is being veneered by an obvious refinement of behavior and dress. That's why they have to train our children to only think and behave superficially. And so the mind of African people cannot be penetrating and cannot be conceptual and abstractive so that we will not be able to see through their game. The so-called inability of black children to think in abstract terms, to think, think conceptually, critically and analytically, 
is not an academic problem it is a political problem you understand that reflects itself as an academic problem because the capacity to think critically and analytically and abstractly and conceptually <coughs> means that we will see through the superficialities that maintains this charade called white American white supremacy. <laughs> so consequently then, these areas in terms of so-called thinking skills must be the areas that black children have the most problems with in the schools because they're the areas where black people in or out of school have the most problems. In order, in a sense, you see, for us to be in the condition we are in, we have to have, <laughs> we have to lose the capacity to see even the obvious and see through the obvious. Yes, it's necessary. It's a necessary condition. And even those blacks who go all the way to the PhDs and all the rest of the Ds are still in the bag. Yes. Still in the same bag. Same bag. The education is used to blind them. Yes. And they're made so proud of their education, they're even worse in many ways. Because their very pride blinds them to the reality. What did I say? When you're learning one thing, you're becoming ignorant of another. So in a sense, education is also a form of becoming ignorant. Yeah. And so when you spend most of your time learning something that is of value to other people and ignoring that which is of greatest value to you, to you, then in a sense your learning becomes a form of ignorance. You see? That is why when you go through all of those stages, your learning cannot be applied to the advancement of African people. Despite the fact that you are head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, your African brothers must fight with sticks and stones to rid themselves of their oppressors. Yeah, that's what it means. You can know all of political science and military science, and yet somehow you cannot transfer it to the liberation struggles of your own people. They didn't teach you how to do that, did they? No. Mm -mm. no. And this is the case with all of the other disciplines. Oh yes. We got black people in economics studying all kinds of curves. You know. They sweep up and down price, cost, equations, and equilibriums, you know. Yeah, they go through all of that. The laugh a curve, which is a laugh. <laughs> you know, and this curve and reading Samuelson from back to back, big, thick books in accounting with no money to count. <laughs> you know, all of this kind of stuff. Thinking now that they're in economics. <laughs> Thinking by learning this, they are going to create wealth. <laughs> Don't you understand what went on? Whites developed these sciences to count the money they stole through slavery and murder and death. The equations and all that stuff came after the original what? Thievery. After they robbed everybody and said, now how are we going to divide this booty up? You know? And now you learn the method of what? Accounting and all this other kind of stuff to distribute now the stolen wealth. See, black people typically get it backwards. We figure we're going to learn the formula and then go the other way. No, you get the wealth first and then, then figure out how to count it. <laughs> how to distribute it, you know, and get all kinds of elaborate formulas about how you're going to allocate what you take. But you ain't got nothing what you're counting for. <laughs> you understand? We don't understand that the basic economics occurred first with the thievery and the taking. And basic economics begin first with war. 
against another people and taking their wealth and redistributing that wealth and then working out the formula by means of which it will be spread to one's community. But of course they take a Negro and figure if he, when he knows the formula, he thinks he knows economics. <laughs> True economics is not taught in economics courses. Not European economics. European economics is taught in history. <laughs> yeah. Just as European psychology is taught in the history. In the history of European behavior. But of course you say they lay it on you. This is non political objective formula. Are you kidding? His object is to rob people. That's the only thing that's objective about it. <laughs> have this violence then and what are we saying then whites must cover over the violence that they are perpetrating in the world a deaf civilization has spread weapons as it spreads weapons in our ghettos it spreads weapons across the world arming nations with powerful weapons chemical and germ warfare seeding the whole world Yes. with instruments of death and oppression and pain. Yeah. All folks are the same. No, black people are not doing that. This is white folk doing this. Yes. Doing this. Spreading death. Well, what great thing science has done for mankind? What mankind are you talking about? <laughs> The vast majority of people have yet to get an indoor toilet of running water. So what is European science done for man? You mean what is it done for what? European man. Where yet only maybe about 10 or 20 percent of the world really enjoys the so-called benefits of science. But you see, you, you, you're so used to being taught that what is European is uni universal. <laughs> until you don't stop and think about it. In fact, they want to impress on, a, on us that their parochial views are what? Universal. Yeah. Look at it. What has European science really bought the bulk of mankind besides pollution, burning out the holes in the, in the ionosphere and in the stratosphere, destroying forests and all these other kinds of things? You see? But we have to understand that. He needs to rationalize this and justify his original sin and not face the reality of who and what he is. And therefore he must engage in denial and deny that he is a criminal and deny that he is not good for the earth. He must project the very opposite in selling his death and destruction to polluting the earth in destroying the character and culture of other peoples in robbing other peoples of their wealth and so forth he must deny that he's involved in criminal activity and deny the pain that he's bringing into the lives of other people and the attack against the earth that he's engaged in and therefore he's engaged in a massive denial of reality and for the victims of Europeans to see them as representing some morally superior people some civilized people, we too must engage in denial of reality as well. And in this sense, then join our victimizers in our own victimization. And this is why I tell you that the black on black criminal is an ally of the white supremacist system. It's a foot soldier for white domination. The whites have to stop hanging us now because their black allies in the community are doing such a great job. This is the game. That means then they must convince the people that they savage, that they are the savages. And the people they criminally mistreat, that they are the criminals. Yes. Yeah. So we get a bunch of people who come all the way across the oceans and poke their long aquiline noses into the business of Native Americans.
and claim then that when they kill them, they are engaging in self-defense against the savages. In other words, in order for them to act like savages and to savage the Indian, they had to label the Indian what? A savage. And reality then is what? Reversed. In order for us to be in the condition we are in today, ladies and gentlemen, as black people, we have to be backwards. Yes. We have to take the lie for truth and the truth for lies. And we have to be excited in love and addicted to lies. That's the only way it can work. Why do we call the white man a demon? He has a major hallmark of the devil. He is the devil. Yes. Read you Christians the story of Adam and Eve and see if not the essential character of the devil there is what? Deception. Yes. Deception. Twisting reality and getting people to behave in terms of that twisted reality. Making himself appear to be good and in favor and bringing great treasures and whatever to the world while he's actually about robbing life itself and killing itself. Yeah, that's the essence of it. The demon is a deceiver, you see. He must make the people who've been most victimized by him love him most. Yeah and forget about their own victimization. Yeah. Willing to starve their children and rob their children of their wealth and give it to someone who's lynched them and murdered them and abused them and everything else and feel good about it. <laughs> so, he calls the Indian a savage so he can treat him savagely. He calls the black man a criminal so he can treat him criminally. When once I've decided that you're a criminal, now I don't have to give you any respect. I can treat you as I have called you. That's the essence of cursing, isn't it? Yeah, you see. Why do we call and make a curse and then we hit? You son of a... You low down. You know... It's hard to say, oh, you're my, you're my life, you're my, and mean it, right? And you, you know, you just mean so much to me, and then what? Fight and hit. You must do what? Demote, you see? And so the, the essence of cursing is to demote the person out of the human race. That's why we like to make them the sons and daughters of animals. You see, are lower than human. And once we do that, then we feel free to attack them because that is the prerogative of man to use and abuse anything less than man in the way we feel like it. So we call them a dirty name and make them less than human. Now we feel free to dog them. Not only do we feel free to dog them, we feel righteous in doing it. We are now ridding the world of this low life. You see, we can even feel that we are serving a holy purpose at that point. Yes. And we have a similar process then. When this European moves into the world and dehumanizes other people, calling them savages and criminals and other names. And of course, as a result of calling them that, now feels free to attack them and destroy them. Yes and may even feel righteous and feel as if they have special permission by God to do so. That this is their divine right on earth. Go ahead. And then twist the minds of the victims themselves to the point where they think that he also has the divine right. And they make them put his pictures in their churches. So when they think of the Godhead, they think white. And think they have some special relation. And that his right to kick our butts is divinely inspired. 
So the projection of our people is criminal is a part of the protecting of the white ego and a part of, of keeping them from confronting their own criminal reality, repenting of their sin and restituting their sins against other people and reparating the harm that they've done to African people. It's a way of saying you deserve what you got. In fact, you were divinely designed for that role in the world as people. And your purpose here on earth is to be abused by us. Or because you are a natural criminal, or you're naturally inferior, or you're naturally less intelligent, and, and so forth and so on. And this is why. This is done. Because you are black. And yes, some black people who believe this. See? They doing this to me because I'm black. They're doing it to you because they're crazy. Because they're psychopathological. It has nothing to do with the color of your skin. Your skin is not the cause of abuse. It is in the abuser. That's why some of us want to lighten up, you see, and then pretend we don't know black from white. Mm. So what do they get into? Self-fulfilling prophecy. Once this projection occurs and they project us as criminal and all of these other things, and this is com combined with their power, they then create the conditions that brings their stereotypes into reality. If I believe you're naturally inferior, if I believe you're naturally criminal, if I believe this negative thing and that negative thing, and I have the power of the purse string, I have power over how you shall live, then I'm not going to waste money on your children in schools. I'll spend 10000 per student, and like in New York sometimes, even $45,000 per year per student on Long Island, as against $6,000 per year in New York City. I won't pay taxes because all it's going to do is go to those people in the inner cities, and they can't learn, and they won't learn, and we're just throwing, you know, good money after bad. You see? I'm not going to build housing because they like to tear up housing. They can't appreciate it. You see, they like dirty streets and, and to rip things apart anyway. That's their nature. You see. So in other words then, they create a reality that fits their perception and their projection. And in reacting to this reality, many of us in reacting to it, actually now become the stereotypes and as I said before now they go around and count how many they've arrested and now they present a statistical game you see how many of them in jail I told you they were criminals these statistics prove it but the whole creative process the whole bias in arrest the bias in sentencing the creating of environments and so forth is discounted and not dealt with. You just count noses in prisons and count arrests and compare what? Percentages. And then you try to convince the people based on the statistics that you created in the first place that, you're, that what you say about these people is true. And some of us are foolish enough to believe it. Believe me, ladies and gentlemen, the criminal is outside the jail. Not in it. We must move on. It's just tragic. We don't have the time. A lot of our psychological, much, much of what we get into is a result of the way we have reacted to white on black violence. And that means we have to get into some self-analysis. How have we reacted? to this attack on our culture and on our history and on our persons, this constant threat that we feel as African people, this constant tension and so forth. How have we dealt with this? I'm going to do another book, I'm, I'm telling you.
And you can name one right after the other, and you will see each one has been taken out of the black personality in order to maintain the system. Now, once you see that, you know what your educational curriculum must be. Thank you. Those things which have been taken out to maintain the system must be what? Put back in. That's why your system is fundamentally different from the education of white children. You see? It in no way will resemble the process that white children are going through. The destiny of black children is revolution. It's to overthrow and change the system. Yeah. If we are at the bottom of this system, and this system rests on top of us, then how can we rise even to equality with other people without throwing them off of our backs? Yeah. It's not possible. And therefore we must be educated to take on this process. And this is a problem of black children, not white children. They're the ones sitting on the top of the pile. So that just it is to what? Stay up there. And therefore they must be educated to maintain their position on top. But if we're on the bottom, it means we must be educated to do what? To rise to the top. That means a different education. This is what African-centered education is about, not just about Columbus missing American shore. It's not just about Egyptology. It's not about, you know, a lot of history. It's about that, but it's more than that. It's a whole social, political, military, economic program. Yes. Ultimately, it's a program of liberation. Yes. And therefore, it covers every sphere of human life. Right. It's not confined just to culture. Not by a long shot. Right. What do we mean here then? So that means we've got to educate our children. If we're believing lies, if we're believing uh, stereotypes, then our children must be what we call psycho-inoculated. They must be armed with a true knowledge of self and a true knowledge of their enemy. So that when their lies and propagandas are spewed forth, they bounce off and run off like water off a duck's back. That's what it's about. That's why you must Africanize them and engage them in African-centered education. If we are inappropriately uh, reacting to the white on black violence, then we must teach coping skills that teach us to react appropriately and to deal with it appropriately. If we are reacting in terms of displaced aggression, then we must be taught who the true enemy is and be taught how to defeat that true enemy. Understand? All of those things, and you can outline it, one, you know, step by step by step, ladies and gentlemen. If, if our problem is being frustrated, then we must train our youth how to deal with frustration in a way that they can turn it to their advantage and against their enemies. And there are definite ways of doing it. If cooperation is a problem in the black community, then we must teach them deliberately in the ways and means of cooperating one with the other. If loving ourselves is a problem, uh, then we must have courses and must teach our children how to love and how to relate one to the other. If reliability in relationship to each other is a problem, then in those early years we must devise games and other kinds of things that teach our children to trust and be reliable and hold keeping their word with one another beyond keeping their word to any other group and any other people. Understand? It's there. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. We'll, we'll work it. I'm going to do a 10-week course. I want some of you to come on down. We'll send the tapes up. And that way we can work these things out in detail. How many remember the Opium Wars? Yeah, it's interesting to study. Study the Opium Wars a bit. Because now I've been talking about the psychological side. Yeah, yeah, come on. Now let's look at the economic side, which is the base of, of uh, basically all of this stuff. If you remember the Opium Wars, the British were trading with the Chinese. The British got hooked to tea, on tea. They became addicted to tea. And the Chinese were the only ones that had it. Okay? An interesting addiction. You know, people don't realize that sugar, what, how sugar transformed the world. You know? As an economic force and, and people became addicted to sugar. And that addictedness to sugar created tremendous wealth and financed the uh, European Industrial Revolution and a whole bit, you see.
But the British got addicted to tea and they built a whole culture around it. Tea at four, tea at four, so, you know, that kind of thing. And the Chinese had a monopoly on it. Okay? And the Chinese says we only want silver and gold. Let's trade. Let's buy it now. Silver and gold. That's all we want from it. Well, you, why don't you buy some things from us? Your manufacturer is, is English is inferior. <laughs> yeah, we'll make it. Yes, right? We make better vases. We, our cotton is superior. Our silk is superior. You have nothing we want. We don't desire anything you have. That was the situation they were in. They couldn't sell the Chinese a thing. The Chinese were self-sufficient and, and they were within their culture and they produced pretty much what they needed within their culture. The British were faced with problems. This goes back to what I talk about when I talk about the production of desire, you see? And it speaks so beautifully to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, which I wish we could understand. Yes, people don't understand it. You're so caught up in his sins, you don't see the other things of great value. You see, this is the thing black people got to fall for, you see. You got to throw the baby out with the wash water. And all we have to do is tell you one negative thing about a person. And whatever else they represented in terms of value, say that when we acted in accordance to our changed taste, our money went to ourselves. You see? And, and, and it's a beautiful system. And it's a, a beautiful economic, social, religious system that you, we have to check out. We haven't had time to analyze it yet, you see? Because, as I said earlier, whites create our taste. In creating our taste, they determine the flow of wealth. You see, if we became self-creators of taste, then we determine what? The flow of wealth. But because we let our taste be manipulated outside of ourselves, our money goes outside of ourselves. Elijah Muhammad created taste within his nation, and the money then did what? Flowed into the nation and was used by the nation. You see? But that's a whole other story, isn't it? But I'm talking about taste. In other words, the Chinese grew rich because they did not let the British manipulate what? Their taste and their desires. The British tastes were set up and the Chinese what? Took advantage of it. And all of a sudden the British were getting in trouble now because they were having great trade imbalances. All of their silver and gold is flowing out by the tons. They can't get off their tea habit. And so now they got a problem. And, I, and, and, and I'm going to come back to this because I'm, I'm building an analogy here. Okay? The wealth was just flowing out. And there was going to be trouble in their economy, in their social system, in the organization of their society. In other words, had it continued, the British society would have broken down. Yeah, yeah, yeah broken down into, into social chaos and so forth. And the British said, we got to do something. And what did they do? We got control of the opium fields of India. And they started doing what? Hooking the Chinese into an opium habit and selling opium to them and now they started demanding silver and gold and at some point then more silver and gold start flowing out of China than flowed in and on top of the, and now the Chinese were threatened with social disorganization because they and the Chinese now didn't have enough money to run their governments and organize their society they were faced with a problem a tremendous outflow of wealth and an addiction problem now they decided that they had to do change this equation. They were going to get rid of their addicts and their addiction problem. And they were going to stop this inflow of opium so that they could stop the outflow of their wealth. And what happened? The British went to war to keep them what? On the habit. How can you dare take your people off of opium and make rules that they shall no longer be addicted and block the inflow of the addictive drugs? And they bring and they bought their warships and their armies and fought the Chinese and attacked them twice so that they could continue the addiction of the Chinese. And I'm telling you something, black folk. When you decide to end 
crack addiction in the black community, you are going to have to fight the police. You are going to have to fight the U.S. government. They are going to protect the drug dealers. Yes. Not directly, they're going to protect them in the name of fighting vigilantism. You're taking the law into your own hands. You see? And so it would be covered up with these nice sounding phrases, but in effect, the people who will be ridding their community of these dealers and ridding their community of the addiction now will be criminalized and will be the object of police suppression. And the criminals who are doing it literally will be protected. Yeah. I'm telling you, a good deal of black on black violence revolves around the issue of authority. That the white community cannot allow black males to take authority in their own community. You know who the dealers are. You see them, you know them, and you see them destroy your children, and you can't do a thing about it. And when you go to the police department, they tell you that they don't have enough people to solve the problem. And then they dare you to solve it. But don't you have the right of self-defense? No, but when you have an oppressive system, you can't allow the oppressed to become authorities unto themselves. You see? So then crime is maintained by the very political and economic system itself, by the oppressive system itself. You understand? When the black man decides then that he is going to stop people from destroying his children and so forth, he must also prepare for war against the U.S. government and system. See, that's why I ask the question of black people, really, are we really ready to solve our problems? You understand? <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a question here. Yeah. Now, what am I saying here then? Let's look at the black community as a nation within a nation. And it's very important that we look at that this way. And you will see the similarities of what I'm talking about in terms of the Chinese. America is two major nations. It's more than one, more than two, but two major nations, black and white. Blacks call themselves Americans, but are treated as aliens. Yes, we are. We are dealt with as a separate nation. Yeah. And we are forced to live, in a sense, on the basis of separation. But we don't want to take that separation as a fact and turn it into power and use it to our advantage as a people. We are, in effect, a nation. Because we have not been assimilated and integrated into the American system by a long shot. We also are not assimilated economically into the system either. The black economy and the white economy have major and significant differences. Yeah. And we have to we have to look at that. In a sense, then the black nation and the black ghettos, the black cities are used as sources of cheap labor. And the capital of the black community is just swept right out in terms of savings, in terms of money we put in the bank, in terms of our shopping and consuming habits, is swept right out. In terms of other ethnic groups owning all of the businesses, coming in during the day and taking the money right out. We have a trade problem, do you understand? In terms of landlords taking the rent out. In terms of civil servants, police, firemen, and other people working in the community doing what? Taking it out. In terms of even educating black children and people in the ghetto who when they get their education and earn their high wages, they will move out with both their brain power and their wealth and take it out. So you got a, you got a human resources drain as well as a capital drain with factories and jobs moving out, what we call a physical capital uh, uh, drain going on. And therefore, as with the British government, the, the black nation then begins to do what? Collapse on itself. It begins to experience, as any nation experiences, social disorganization once its trade balance becomes negative. 
its creditors come to own it just as the Japanese are coming to own America and becoming to control its economic social and cultural life you know how it is when you get indebted they start gunning you in your check taking possession of your furniture yeah. telling you how to spend your own money the whole bit yes yeah. the same thing goes on with nations yeah, yeah, yeah. come in and take your wife yeah, yeah. do all kinds of things so you, you, you have no control over your house nor your life nor your possessions nor anything else it belongs to the creditor when you get a negative balance that same thing happens to a nation your wife gets angry with you you get angry with her the children lose respect for you you lose self-respect you know why should I say what you why should I do what you say you ain't bringing in no money though huh? what do you say when a woman tell you I'm earning the money in this house you ain't bringing that man you know the whole bit same thing happens within groups why should I submit to your authority black man or black woman you're not providing me with jobs you're not providing a way for me to survive why should I follow the values you tell me I should learn? I'm not gaining anything from it. I'm going to sell my body. That's the only way I can get money. I'm going to sell drugs. That's the only way I can get money. I'm going to rob. That's the only way I can get money. I'm going to steal. I'm going to do this. This is what happens to a nation when it gets a negative trade in, uh, uh, balance. You understand? Right. And this is this kind of situation that's happening in the inner cities of America with the outflow of billions of dollars, $300 billion flowing out of the community. And now you call yourself having black mayors and other people. That means these mayors, like Dinkins, have control over billions of dollars as well in these city treasuries. And if they're used correctly, could enrich and take half or more of the black community right off welfare if they churn it, the city treasury, like other ethnic groups do, into their own ethnic community. You understand? And we have these billions in terms of what we earn, and these other billions in terms of what we control, and yet we are not directing the flow of wealth. And therefore, after we spend all of this money and our brains flow out and our monies flow out, the drug dealers come in and get the rest. They take the baby money. They take the rent money. They take the very basic money. They start relatives stealing from each other. We start selling the furniture and everything else to meet our addiction. So the community does that, so that they can do what? Carry the wealth out as well. You see, if they were a criminal organization and sold drugs where? Outside and bought money in, then we would start enjoying art and music and fine manners. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be real. That's the way the game is that's the way the game goes. The mafia man goes out and robs and steals and murders and sends his sons and daughters to college. And they learn good manners in the whole bit. You understand? In other words, when we reverse the flow of wealth, when we start maintaining the wealth that we have in this community, and then on top of that bring more in, then you will see the behavior of our people change as if by magic. That's right. yeah, that's right. You will see our relationship yeah. one with the other change. Right. You will see our manners and the whole bit what? change and attitudes yes. change. You understand what I mean? Yes. So what does that mean then? That the black community must come into its ethnicity, operate in terms of its ethnicity. It must face the fact that it has to up the ante in racial tension. That's right. It must run out the other ethnic groups from its midst. You must become unpopular with Koreans. You must become unpopular with Indians and Arabs and, and whites and all the rest of them. Because they depend on our not owning. They depend on our not controlling. And they're going to call you reverse racist and all these other things. But you've got to stand up to it and deal with it. You understand? And after you capture... And, and after you capture your internal market, 
That's not the end of it. You're going to go and start owning America itself. You're coming right on into the so-called mainstream. And you're not going to work for IBM. You're going to own it. And you're going to enter into partnership with it. And that can be done, I'm telling you. When I talk about us being consumers, that's a power. Because whenever you got something people want, you got power over them. That's right. Yes. What did I say? We buy over six hundred million dollars worth of beer, and we let old Coors Beer finance right white wingers, and we do buck dancing on UNCF fundraising things, so that these people, these beer companies with whom we spend six hundred million dollars, come up and give us a seventy-five dollar check, and we all think, <laughs> "What are you jumping for?" <laughs> You're spending over ten million dollars a week. They should bring six or ten million dollars to the United Negro College. <laughs> not seventy-five thousand dollars. Not ten thousand dollars. I'm telling you, you got them by the balls. You understand? And you say when we have this next UNCL, you're going to bring ten million because we are not going to buy your beer for a week. And then the next week we're going to boycott you again. You understand? And we're going to boycott you again. They'll bring it. Don't worry about it. It's your money anyway. And think of all the other billions. You even make this enemy finance your economic growth and development. Because it's your money. But you got to be willing to do it. You see? And then when you put a squeeze on him, you're going to make him hand over some shares. Yes. Another thing, come on, hang in with me, folks. <laughs> in the end, the only weapon that poor people have ultimately is the weapon of social chaos and disruption. And you got to be willing to use that too. If I ain't going to get it, you ain't going to get it. That's right. You're not going to live comfortably with it. I'm going to disturb your system and disturb you. You understand? Because we know one thing about the ruling class, they only react to threat and to endangerment. And the ability to threaten the physical and psychological health of another person is also a power. You understand? I feel like I'm losing you here. I come back the next time we'll talk about the organization of power we got tremendous power as African people tremendous remember what I said you can ex- you can explain the behavior of the white man in terms of his living in caves if you want to you can try to explain away his foolish and criminal behavior you can explain it in terms of his genetics and trying to protect his gene pool you can talk about him knocking white balls into black holes and all that stuff. You know, if that gives you a rise. And all this other stuff. But in the end, it is the ability that, what did I say this morning? The white man does what he does because he has the power to do so. I don't care how he got, got it. I don't care how he's been psychologically motivated to get it. He's got it and he's using it against us. And what is the solution then? We must neutralize his capacity to abuse us. That's the only solution, I'm telling you. You're not going to turn him into this devil into a Christian and, and, and persuade him morally. And even if you do it temporarily, there's no assurance that at some point he might become crazy again. You must remove his capacity to perpetrate his evil on earth, which means you got to meet his power with power. Which means then we must study power as subject matter. Subject, and study its acquisition, its organization, and study the European acquisition and organization of power so that we can learn its weaknesses, so that we can destroy that power and use it to our advantage. I've got to run again. Thank you very much.